Hey, today is February 26, 2018, and you are listening to Human Factors Cast episode 79. Today on Human Factors Cast, we're talking about building Alexa skills without code. True story, I did it. Predicting heart attacks with AI. What VR has to do with canes and much, much more. Should we build an Alexa skill now? Well, I just alluded to it in the intro. Let us know. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Messing up the outro intros all the time, every time. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined as always by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnstorff, hanging out over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on, Nick? How are you today? Hey, man, I am good. Um, I Well, you know what? I'm lying if I'm saying I'm good. Uh, you know, stress of the real world is kind of taking its toll, but it's okay. We're here to talk human factors. We're not going to let the stress of the real world kind of impose on our ability to speak about human factors this week. How about you, Blake? What's going on in your world? Man, I'm pretty good. I'm feeling some of the stresses of the world like yourself, but we're here to talk Human factors have a little bit of fun, and actually, I'm going to have some fun this evening, because after the podcast, I'm going to drive to Yosemite, the beautiful snowy mountain, and hang out with a bunch of UX designers and learn some stuff, I hope. But anyway, I'm going to go to a conference called Epicurance, or Epicurance, something like Epicurance. that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be, it'll be a good time. I'm looking forward to it. Not looking forward to this like seven hour drive, uh, but super stoked. Um, that's kind of all I got. I'm kind of boring this week. No, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, you told me you had some other stuff going on this weekend that, you know, it's, it's okay. We don't always have human factor stuff to talk about, but we got other stuff. So if you plan on going to the Epicurrence conference, go check out our boy, Mr. Blake Arnstorff. He'll be hanging out up there in the snowy, snowy mountains of Yosemite. Yes, sir. I'll be hanging out, answering questions, asking a lot of questions, making friends, all that kind of stuff. I love it. Well, Blake, I got to talk to you about this thing. Uh, have you heard of Rec Room? Uh, I've heard of a Rec Room, but I'm assuming you're alluding to a specific one. Yes. So Rec Room uh, is this sort of virtual reality space. Um, and I, I should have known. Yeah, right. Uh, so let me sort of let me read the description of this thing. So it's a virtual reality social club where you play active games with your with friends from all around the world. Um Customize your appearance, then party up to play multiplayer games like pinball, 3D, charades, and even co-op adventures. Come and join the fun for free. So this is a free online experience. And, um, you know, the the you kind of go in and you create your avatar, and it looks like sort of these uh, like disembodied Lego figurines, honestly. Um, it's, it's so like you have your head, and then your body is disconnected from your head, and then you have your hands that are kind of disconnected from your body, but everything's kind of moving, and you're like walking around this space, and I had the most surreal experience because literally this this game taps into your microphone, right? And so so anyone that you interact with in the game has to be through verbal speech. And so a lot of it was little kids running around going, you know, like, like, oh my, right, that right? would have been overwhelming. So you can kick those guys, but the the like weirdest thing to me was just the um sort of interactions that I had with these people who I had no idea what they look like. You're interacting in a virtual space, like you're grabbing stuff and throwing it around, and like there's laser tag and there's adventure quests, and then there's um like all these custom rooms and. People are doing weird stuff in there, but there's also people who are, like, in there trying to help you out, right? So, like, yeah, you know what weird stuff I'm talking about. I see you laughing over there. So, like, the thing was, I I got, I was in the lobby, which is kind of like this gym, and there's, like, this little kid running around, and everyone's, like, picking on this little kid just because he's being obnoxious and annoying, right? And so, like, eventually... They all kick him, and then we all start having this conversation, and I'm like, I don't know what's going on, man. This is, like, my first night here. I have no idea what's going on. Um, and this guy was, like, super nice. He was like, so here's what you do. So you see I can't, like, put my hand inside you, which means your um, bubble of – I forget what they called it, but it's like some sort of personal space bubble that you can allow people into. So you can set confines 
on your what? personal yeah right that's what i'm saying so you can set confines on this personal bubble you can also set like all these different parameters and who's walking me through all these things that you wouldn't know if you were a novice user and he's basically telling me all this stuff and i'm like man this is awesome and he's like yeah if you have any other questions just ask another level 30 we're all super he helpful and if they're not then they're playing this game wrong and i just thought it was such a cool interesting experience that if you guys have a vr headset or a vr setup um i this is on i my experience was on playstation 4 but i know it's across everything uh htc vive oculus um everything so I, i'll be checking it out again it was really surreal though to kind of just this living breathing world this is a social experience in your living room that kind of felt uncomfortable at times but at the same time was exciting and a novel experience that I really haven't had in VR in a long time as uh, being someone who studies it and and works with it you know yeah man I'm looking at some screenshots from this and it looks pretty crazy like what you were describing with the dis it like you're kind of disembodied and you're separate your head kind of separates from your body and so does your arms that would have just felt nuts so you did this through your PSVR right yes I did wow Oh, man. I would love to come over and see what this is like because it looks just kind of insane. I wouldn't even – like, how did it feel to move? Uh, all that? So so the movement was handled through teleportation. So you basically aim your little uh, – you aim your controller at some place on the ground, and then you press the center button to warp there. And it kind of does this, like, black hole tube effect where it kind of whooshes around. Uh, you, you played Batman Arkham VR when you were over, right? Yeah, yeah. It kind of the same effect, right? Where it kind of tunnel visions, maybe blacks out a little bit, and then you're teleported in the new place, and gotcha. it it reduces the um, sort of motion sickness uh, causing aspects of movement in virtual spaces. Uh, another piece of this, though, like that, I just got to comment on really quick before we jump into the news stories, uh, is is the physicality. A lot of the games are built around physicality, right? So you're the uh, the only one I played was laser tag but I, I read into some of the other ones but laser tag so you're sitting there you're shooting other people you have to literally cock your gun when you run out of lasers and then shoot it again and then um when one of your teammates goes down you have to teleport over to them and give them a high five physically with your hand so you have to like high five these other players in this environment to get them back up and then uh i don't know i just had a really positive experience which is so bizarre for an online game especially one where um you know you're interacting with uh avatars instead of i don't know maybe the avatar embodiment now i'm like hypothesizing as to why this environment is different from other video games where you may be anonymous behind just a gamer tag or something I don't know. Well, it sounds like too. You, there's a combination of like the the anonymous part, but people people sometimes when a game first comes out, especially I would assume in VR, like they they get really excited about it. Like it's not like Call of Duty where it's just a it can potentially be a bunch of really mean people in one lobby. Like this sounds like you you ended up running into people that have been trying to figure out how the game works and play it the best, and also show people how to get get like or have a better understanding of what you can do and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, it, it was funny because I was eavesdropping a lot. I'm, I'm pretty it, funny enough as a podcast host, I'm pretty quiet in real life. I'll sit and kind of observe and take everything in. And any comments that I actually have to say, I make sure they are spoken with weight and that I, I know what I'm talking about before I open my mouth, right? And so uh, a lot of my experience was eavesdropping, but a lot of people were having such a great time. They're like, oh my God, this is awesome. I've never experienced anything like this before. And that is why I study VR, that very reason to see people go, wow, this is an experience that I can't get anywhere else. Okay, with that all said, uh, we got a couple stuff to plug, right? We got our Slack community, um, yeah, Slack community as usual. Yeah, that's that's been going great. Join us on Slack. Links in the show notes. Uh, we got we got a couple stuff in there. You guys could should go check it out. A lot of good conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm just poking my head in there right now to see kind of what we're talking about in there. We got uh, oh the Snapchat redesign. Uh, and I could plug some I put in there earlier in our resources. Oh yes, um, please do. If anybody didn't get to like myself get to go to interaction 18 this year i think that was sometime in january uh, but it's a big interaction conference put on by the iaxda and they put all the talks 
up on I think it's on Vimeo, but there's a link in our Slack, so hop on our Slack, and you can find it in the resources channel. Uh, but it just has all the talks from the conference, kind of breakdowns of what happened, other than just talks. So it's a it's a good set of videos to check out. Yeah, in addition to that, there's uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, plugs for local events. So if you're um, you if you get on our Slack, you may connect with somebody who's nearby, or at least find events that are nearby you. Um, and I know so. Somebody brought this up in Slack, uh, one of our most frequent posters, Mateo. He actually brought up the fact that, uh, you know, there's HFES, HFES in Australia. And I did want to bring this up, too, because we actually brought attention to another one of our listeners that there's an HFES division in Germany. And wherever you live, it's crazy that we have an international audience, first off. But wherever you live, there's probably an HFES sect near you. So please, please, please check it out. And if you can't find it on the web, um, jump in our Slack and we'll see if we can get you some help. So I, <laughs> I think that's a, that's, that's good coverage for our Slack. I think, I think people get the point. Join our Slack. Link is in the show notes. Okay, man. I think we should get into the human factors news. Oh yeah. The one thing I do want to plug oh, yeah, yeah, for a couple of weeks from now is the human factors healthcare symposium. So that's in Boston, March 26th to 28th. And I'm going to, have a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine. My girlfriend's actually going to the conference, and I'm going to have her kind of come on the show and help us out and talk about it a little bit. But anybody that's there, if you happen to want to meet up and talk human factors, I'll be around the conference. So you can always reach out to me through our Human Factors Cast Slack. We're going to try to sneak Blake in and get our microphones on the scene and get some uh, exclusive interviews with people. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But yes, Blake will be there. Meet and greet with him. Um, I know it's a little soon to start thinking about HFES this year, but please, 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 if you're thinking about HFES this year in Philly, uh, looks like both Blake and I are planning on on showing up. So uh, who knows? We might even do a Human Factors cast live. So stay tuned for that. If you can make it this year, we'd love to see you. Okay. Please do. Any other plugs before we jump into the news? Uh, if you're in LA on Thursday, come out to the Adobe Creative Jam. It's faux free and you can... It'll just be a good time. Lots of L.A. creatives, everybody from Headspace to bigger tech companies. So if you're in L.A., come through. All right. Let's get into the Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about anything related to the field of Human Factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, AI, VR, whatever it is. You name it. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, guys. So believe it or not, 39 million Americans have a smart speaker device, but the voice UI world is still developing. So while Alexa has over 200 or 25,000 skills available, a number of companies haven't yet built a skill on the platform or offer a very basic skill that doesn't really work that well. But have no fear, there's a startup called Storyline that is here to help us create all the skills we could ever need. The company is offering an easy-to-use drag-and-drop visual interface for building Amazon Alexa skills that doesn't require you to have any knowledge of code. Storyline came up with this idea through research insights that saw that a big struggle with creating conversational apps was that creative people and other content creators really just don't know how to write the code to make them. And Storyline will let them do just that. And as Nick and I alluded to at the beginning of the show, seems like we do have an Alexa skill hanging out somewhere. Yes, we do. So I actually posted this on our Slack earlier this week. Um, but hang on, let me see if I can pull this up. So Blake, you won't hear this, but but uh, react as if you do. <gasps> <laughs> okay, here we go. This is Alexa. This is this is part of the app that I built. Hello, welcome to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host. Alexa, joined by Nick Rome and Blake Arnstorf. Nick, what's your favorite segment of Human Factors cast? The banter. Well, you and Blake better start bantering then. All right. So, so that was Alexa saying, "Hello, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors cast." And uh uh, yeah, I don't know. The volume looked really low on that, so we'll see how that comes out. But anyway, I built this. I built this thing. Uh, you can definitely check that out in our Slack. Um, you know, I, I went through kind of all the conversation options. It's really so. This thing is really cool for a variety of reasons. So you have sort of this nodal interface where you can set up um, a series of events in one of these. It's, it's like Visual Logic, if you will. 
Um, that's exactly what it is. But but from these separate sort of response options, you can create several different trees, and from these trees, you can make different response options. So if you think about building like a trivia app, you would have Alexa ask a question, and then if you're correct, she would move on to the next question. If you were incorrect, she would say, wrong, game over, thanks for playing, try again. Um, so it's pretty cool. I think this is uh, a good example of how... Um, Elevating logic into a simple, easy to understand uh, uh, format is going to change the way not only that people like you and I program things, Blake, but the way future generations will program things. Because now I don't have to know a lick of code to do this. I yeah, and I'm, that makes a whole lot of sense because I mean to get this kind of technology into more people's hands you would need something that allows for the you know the barrier to entry to be low because there's another company called metaverse that's done something very similar to this for ar apps that allow you to allow kids like in classrooms as young as like being in kindergarten to build drag and drop ar experiences so it's awesome that like there's somebody doing that for alexa skills especially with this conversational ui yeah uh, i'm i'm working on getting this actually deployed to Alexa because I, I so the way you have to sign up for this thing is a little clunky you have to sign up for an Amazon developer account and say no I'm not making any money off this what are you talking about and then um, and then you make your app and then you deploy it to your local echo but I haven't figured out quite how to um, deploy it uh, to to external you know like on the store i haven't figured out how to do that yet uh but once that becomes available who knows you might be able to say alexa launch human factors cast and then you can make your own human factors cast in your living room by yourself with alexa and she can be your co-host and then you can record it and send it as fan fiction to us i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing please make an alexa skill and send us fan fiction that would be I awesome would yeah listen I w- to all of it i am curious as to what some of our listeners could come up with so yeah i encourage you all to go try it it's fun um you know i i i don't really have any other things to say other than this is this is a pretty awesome thing and i'm glad that something like this is uh is is coming to the masses and especially something so easily accessible as as an echo um i i I really like where this is going yeah i mean the thing that struck me as insane is i didn't realize so many millions of people just in america alone have these devices in their home and now you just have created access for them to be able to develop maybe helpful ui conversational basically skills that they can have for their own alexa and all that kind of stuff so it is super cool yeah all right well why don't we get into our next story Oh, man, here we go. So Google scientists have done it again. They've discovered a new way to assess a person's heart risk of heart disease using machine learning. So by analyzing scans of the back of someone's eye, a machine learning algorithm can accurately deduce data, including that person's age, their blood pressure, and whether or not they actually smoke. This can this data can be, then be used to predict their risk of suffering for a major cardiac event, such as a heart attack, with rough, roughly the same accuracy as the leading methods. So the algorithm potentially makes it quicker and easier for doctors to analyze a patient's cardiovascular risk, as it doesn't require any sort of blood test. But, of course, this method will need to be tested more thoroughly before it be, can be used in a clinical setting. It, it just blows me away that we keep getting these stories that are pushing... AI algorithms into being able to identify various diseases and potentially, I would assume in this case, stop them from an early onset. But it blows me away that this is being done by scanning your your eyes, basically. Retina scan complete. Yeah, no kidding. This is so. I'm I'm also blown away by the fact that every week it seems like we're getting some sort of integration between artificial intelligence and the medical field where. These non-invasive sort of procedures are are uh, predicting sort of health conditions. Like like a couple of weeks ago, we had you know the Fitbit stories predicting um, your uh, your likelihood for heart problems, and then we had that algorithm that could predict your death. Like, and all of this is artificial intelligence tied to the medical field, and it really kind of opens my eye open <laughs> opens my eyes no pun intended for like you know sort of the future of where we're going with this technology and and where can artificial intelligence play a role going forward in ways that maybe we're not aware of yet i mean this is this is a big step 
Oh, it is. It's huge. And I think it's it's kind of an interesting, I don't, I don't know, dichotomy between we often talk about on the show, the problems with allowing data to just be so accessible. Well, in this case, without having all this information related to past patient health or even current eye scans, we wouldn't have something like this that could identify without an invasive test of like a blood test to tell you, OK, you're potentially going to have a cardiac event of some kind. Uh, so there, there's obviously this really fine line that we have to think about definitely as human factors, practitioners, engineers, and designers, like where do we draw the line between what data, data is accessible versus not? Because there's the flip side of the AI coin of where we're living almost in the kind of 1984 world where we have smart cities and police that have a lot more access to kind of the information that we put out there or cameras always watching you. So it's a, it's a cool, cool uh, space to be working in for sure. Yeah, so one point that they bring up in the article is that the algorithm was able to tell who had a cardiovascular event in the last five years. 70% of the time, it was accurate. Um, And they compare this to the SCORE method, S-C-O-R-E, all caps, um, of predicting cardiovascular risk, which uh, requires a blood test and, and, you know, makes correct predictions in the same test uh, 72% of the time. So so it's with more data we will get past that um the efficacy of the score method. I I feel and it's it's an important point to note because some of these method like uh, we saw the first AI predicted or AI algorithm approved by the FDA a couple weeks ago. And it's cases like this where I say where I think, you know, like this is going to be the future where where the actual artificial intelligence unit is able to predict better than anything we've had before. And I, I just, I feel, I feel, Blake, I don't know, maybe I'm just a cynic, that we're going to have some sort of hang-up legislatively. We're going to have some sort of hang And that's a United States thing. Who knows, you know, for other places. But I feel like we're going to have some sort of hang-up legislatively, uh, ethically. I feel like we're going to have a hang up, but I feel also like this technology is getting close enough to the point where people are okay with it. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it just all depends because the FDA is very, very strict about how it puts its rules in place. And I mean, it'll be important for them to define the benchmarks for, OK, what what's enough testing? What's a acceptable rate? Um of you know success of this particular algorithm, how much data needs to be tested or run through it before we make any decisions. But I think the ethical thing is a is a bigger problem, right? Because I I don't know. I've never talked to, unfortunately, ever talked to a doctor specifically or a nurse specifically about how they feel about this kind of technology. Because in some senses, what if it's conflicting with what you have to say? And then who's who's really better to make the decision or to make the call, especially in this case, where we're talking about potentially having a cardiac event um, that could that could be fatal or that could be massive. Um, and then and then we get into the funny question again that we've talked about with auto autonomous vehicles is who becomes a fault then? Because right now it would be wh- whatever the doctor is. But in if we're adding all this A.I. in there and that's making more of the decisions, I think that just brings another very gray area to have to combat. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that this is an interesting development and I feel like I always end with that. This is interesting, but it really is because I, I, I'm, I am going to watch AI's role in going forward in, in the medical industry, uh, or healthcare specifically with great interest because I, I know that there's this hang up, but there's also sort of this hope that. AI can do what we can't. And uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just excited to see where it goes. Well, I think part of the cool aspect of AI is it's allowing us to kind of use different parts of what we know about the body to enable us to make decisions. Because in this case, now we're removing having to take a blood test or having any kind of fear of needles put into place. And we're using a method called um, or a method that's been traditionally used before about, you know, <laughs> measuring your how what's going on in the back of your eye and helping that predict your overall health. Uh, so it's a pretty cool instance. Uh, I just had a quick side note. Um, I think that what would have been a better intro to this this show instead of me messing it up was saying something like your fundus is showing, which is the rear interior of the eye. 
Oh, man. Fun just jokes. Only on uh, Human Factors cast. Yeah. Missed opportunity. All right. Well, why don't we jump into our next story? But before we do, before we do, let's go ahead and thank our friends over at TechCrunch, The Verge, and The Next Web. If you want to follow along with us, you can follow us all over social media for links to the original articles and in our Slack. We do post those before everybody else gets them, and there's a lot of good conversation to be had over there in that space. Okay, Blake, now uh, let's move on to the next story before I mess this up again. Here we go. All right. So Microsoft recently developed a haptic controller for VR with a very unusual target audience in mind, and that being the visually impaired. So developers from Microsoft's research lab created a cane troller, which is a peripheral device designed to work with the HEC Vive headset and tracker. The team's goal was to create a device that would successfully enable the visually impaired to form an accurate mental model of a virtual space. The cane troller works by translating traditional a traditional experience using a white cane, a long stick used by the visually impaired to tactically scan their environment and then translate that into an actual virtual environment. So last week, Nick, we were seeing VR that would make people be able to see, and now this pe- this might allow people to interact a little more with VR with a little bit less cost. Yeah, so I got nothing to say about this story. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Are you kidding me? This is amazing. I love this. I love this. I'm I'm still a little um iffy on the on the technology used because it it's it's some sort of haptic feedback that lets you know that you're interacting with something. But the the fact that they're allowing blind users to interact with a a virtual space, this is awesome. So the way this works is they have a cane. And they're also wearing this apparatus around their stomach. And this apparatus is, uh, it kind of has a secondary cane that is attached to your primary cane that you're actually operating. Now, when you hit a virtual object, the apparatus that is hanging off of your stomach that is directing the secondary cane is stopping the primary cane that you have in your right hand from interacting with this with this object in the virtual space uh so i feel like i i tried to explain it there blake do you understand what i'm talking about what's going on there yeah i do and i i think that was a really good explanation without having a visual so props to you sir uh but the the thing that's kind of extremely interesting to me and i swear if i use instagram one more time it's the worst uh but it really it really is in this case because we're taking how people would navigate the traditional world to have visual impairments using a cane. And now we're translating that into basically audio signals that are going to help them kind of localize things in the, in the virtual environment. Um, Now they do mention in the article a little bit that some of the users didn't think that it was as up to snuff as, you know, being out in the real world using their actual cane being to get a better sense of where they are, what uh, kind of what, sounds are bouncing off objects that kind of stuff but it's a definitely an improvement i just really want to know where what giant because i know there's got to be some very awesome benefits to being able to access v- virtual spaces um with visual impairments like this i just don't really have any off the top of my head i don't know if it's helping you to maybe understand the map of your city if you're like very new to using a cane maybe getting you prepared to walk around a an area that you've never been before or what i don't know nick what kind of potential do you think this has for people with visual impairments i think you just nailed it right on the head man i was going to talk about the application and all three of those are examples right so Let's say you have a blind person who needs to navigate. Like, let's say uh, you have a blind person that needs to navigate to the train station. And you load up a virtual simulation of a 3D environment that is mapped from your house to the train station. And you can kind of um, use certain techniques to loop it around on itself and and get the blind person to, to um, navigate their way on their own in practice without fear of any sort of external stimuli so that way they at least form this mental model of i'm leaving my house i make a left i go down the street i make a right i go down the street about this far there should be this landmark on the right that i will feel for and then that's when i make a right and then the train station is right there so if if they build this mental model and are feeling for landmarks because they they've God, they feel landmarks different than we view landmarks, right? You and I can see the thing off the freeway when we're approaching 
uh, home. And we know, oh, okay, that's a visual landmark for me. I know we're close to home. But for them, it's very much like a, a search-based thing, right? They, they have a mental model of where they are in space, but they don't necessarily, they feel for things. Um, and I know this because I've done a little bit of research on visually impaired individuals and, and soundscapes. Um, if you're interested, come join us on Slack. I'll, I'll let you know about that. But um, so, yeah, that's that's how they're experiencing the world. And uh, I think you also made a good point with um, visiting spaces that they are going to go to. Let's say they're being um, transported somewhere and they want to uh, navigate through, oh, I don't know, a hedge maze or something. I'm using an extreme example here. But if they want to get through a hedge maze and they don't want to get lost in this hedge maze, I mean, that'd be mortifying if you were visually impaired and you couldn't navigate through a hedge maze, right? So they can kind of go through and um, still be one with nature, but um, they had practice first. So that's another instance where uh, I can see this being used. A third application is, let's say you have a newly visually impaired individual. Uh, someone who has just lost their sight um, and they need practice identifying uh, sort of what different objects are. So it's it's a very sort of sterile experimental environment in which let's say maybe a blind person whacks their cane up against a uh, mailbox or something and they can start to feel what these shapes feel like. So that way when they navigate... Um, sort of these these uh, everyday objects like mailboxes, trees, car tires, um, the bumps on the the sidewalk that indicate you're about to cross a street, um, street signs, all these things they can sort of train themselves to understand what that feels like when they when they use when they interact with it in a virtual environment before they actually go out into the physical space. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense, especially in in the unfortunate case if you are all of a sudden like you have visual, you have sight, but it's some for some reason or another you become visually impaired. I mean, this kind of training space could help you one figure out how your new set of, I guess in this case, auditory auditory mental models are going to come together, what you feel in the space, what objects you can kind of recognize as familiar, like Nick was talking about, maybe the bumps in the road signifying that danger is coming if you're not like prepared for the situation so that's that's some great points nick and this is this is really cool to see this coming out from just microsoft's lab um especially last week when we were talking about like basically using some sort of vr headset to help people see that haven't seen before um and again this could be a lower cost option yeah no kidding all right well let's get into our last story of the week Oh, man. So IBM and Unity to last week man announced a, pow- a partnership to Watson's AI functionality, which is the most po- with the most popular gaming engine within built in AR with built in AR features. So IBM's Watson Unity SDK is available for free on the Unity Asset Store and gives Unity developers access to Watson and its AI and a suite of its AI functions. So this means that millions of developers can now integrate AI into VR and AR games with relative ease directly within the game's engine. This partnership could change how all of this works. So with a new new technologies enter into the mixed reality market, such as the Microsoft HoloLens and the Magic Leap, um, that don't require to be te- you to be tethered to a computer, the AR VR space is finally about to really heat up. And you know, Nick, I wonder if this is actually true, that if we're going to see uh, all these uh, different headsets that are no longer going to be required to be tethered to a computer in co- combination with AI to maybe help with some of, the, some of the engine problems or how people experience space, if this is really going to change the game for AR and VR. I think it definitely is. I think I even reached out a couple of weeks ago to see if anyone was into um, sort of uh, procedural generation of virtual environments. Um, and I think this kind of closely resembles that, right? So, so hold on. Before you go too yeah. far, would you mind just breaking down what procedural generation <laughs> of environments is? Sure. Uh, so procedural generation of virtual environments is basically... Um, like like artificially intelligently created uh environments in virtual spaces gotcha do you try okay all right great so i think that um so okay 
lost my train of thought there. So uh, that's the environment side of things. But now with uh, the the AI that Watson provides, you can do so much more, right? So this is um, so this is actually interacting with an agent in virtual spaces, and you could artificially create agents as well. So now uh, there's another thing that I there's another story this week that was like block chain block blockchain technology generating virtual spaces um, and pairing that with this you could basically create these um, sort of completely AI driven virtual environments that could either be a landscape of hell literally like I <laughs> can you can ima- you've seen some of the stuff that AI has produced you can imagine what it will come up with right especially when you have something like Watson behind it like I, I don't know I am really excited uh, about this because it there's so much stuff to go here and I'm I just I'm I'm so excited I can't even wrap my head around it right now <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I do, I'm digging back into the article a little bit, and I'm seeing some of the the reasons why Watson's going to make this so much more of an uh, like a realistic experience. I mean, beyond of course what we're talking about, if headsets are now untethered from computers and have this kind of com- power to them, it's going to be insane. You're just going to feel like, besides the weight of the headset, which won't always be the case, I'm sure, right. but you'll feel like this is normal. Um, but an example they give is they talk about the, uh, and we've talked about this on the show before, but like a surgery simulator, right? So this is where you would be, be in like a, an OR as a surgeon practicing or going through the motions. Well, there's certain kind of, uh, kind of activities that you have to perform as a surgeon where you're relying on other people in the room, like a nurse or an, uh, anesthesiologist i thought i was gonna screw that word up but we got it you got it but anyway so what you can do with watson integrated now is using kind of voice controls to keep you immersed so you could say nurse hand me a sponge and the game could figure out like okay you just ask me for a sponge i need to compute and give him an actual sponge so things like that allow you to kind of really feel like you're interacting with the real world and then this kind of same these same ideas can apply to you know more of the gaming side of things too it can with it being able to recognize your what you're saying or what you have, what it's seeing, uh, it can provide different game elements for you, whether it's in AR or VR. Uh, man, this is this is really getting me excited about trying one of these experiences as it just gets more um, integrated into the mainstream. Yeah, so I'm still a little skeptical about the integration piece. Right? Is it literally creating a sponge after? Um, like, is this an existing asset, or is is Watson comprehending that it needs a sponge and then it's going and creating assets live because that is truly the future when it can go and generate assets on the fly live like that. That That's so scary though to me because that, <laughs> that means it's likely doing that at a rate that makes you think that that's not happening and that kind of computing power is nuts because I'm sure right now it's just, it's pre-generated assets oh, yeah. based off that's... of the data that it has. But I'm sure it'll get to the point where it's just going to be building things on the fly as you ask for it, kind of like you were walking through the matrix and it's building a you know a map of the world for you. Side side tangent here. Uh, I think I've mentioned it on the for on the on the show before. You know I've never seen the matrix, right? No, I didn't. I thought Elise was the only one. That's no. Nuts. So, okay. So it's become sort of a running joke for me. I know basically the entire plot of the matrix. I know oh, sure at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I know the red pill, the blue pill. I know all of it. Right. And so I <laughs> like the joke is, wait, but you study virtual environments and you've never seen the matrix. You know, this is a ongoing joke in my lab. <laughs> oh, that's great. You, you wait, you really, you've never seen. And so, you know, I've had several opportunities to, and I've always opted out because it's something unique that I can say, yeah, I've never seen it. It's just, you know, ah, like I hold bummer. on to it. That's the Wachowskis at their best. Oh, I know. I don't know. I, I know. like Sense8, so I won't say that's a, them at their best. But I, uh, anyway, I, that's funny. I would have pictured you as somebody that would see that, not just because you work in virtual environments, but you come off as somebody who likes sci-fi as much as I do. So. Yeah. But anyway. Well, well cool. I'm starting Sense8, so we'll see. I, I just got through the first episode this weekend. Oh, man. Uh, should we do a Sense8 podcast? Is that what? <laughs> no. No. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it'll come back, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll come back. Oh, man. Once you get to season two, we'll have a chat. Okay. All right. All right. I, I sense that you're upset about it. All right. That's a good side tangent, though. All right. Well, uh, I think well, that's that's everything I have to say about it. Yeah, man. You know that's what time exciting. it is. I do know what time it is. <laughs> 
it came from it's time for me to mess up the button press again for the second week in a row it's time for it came from reddit this is the part well, of the I you did it fine <laughs> no i had the fader down it's okay all right so let's switch gears and get to it came from reddit this is the part of the show where we search all over reddit to bring you topics that you guys the community is talking about any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion among the community all right blake so looks like we got time for two of them today uh, which ones do you want to take? One, two, three, four. Oh, uh, you know what? I don't know, man. I kind of wanted you to answer number one for sure, because I know you've got a lot of experience more on like the virtual world side of things, so it might be interesting. Sure. Okay, so let me let me pull this guy up here. This so this is just a question posed on the uh, HCI subreddit. Yeah, some HCI love. I love it. Uh, this is by Design Guy with a Z, Design Guy, uh, and he asks, I'm, I'm presuming it's a male because Design Guy, uh, <laughs> who are some of the leading minds in HCI? Um, man, I really wish I had one of my bookmarks that I have at work on my computer right now because he is great. Um, so <laughs> obviously, uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to jump in and just say like the big names, obviously you got Don Norman, um, Steve Krug, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. why am I blanking on some of these names? Jared Spool. Um, help me out, Blake. I'm blanking on names. Oh, that's all good. Bill so, Buxton. So, <laughs> some of my favorites are definitely Frank Durso. Like, uh, he w had a really big impact on me from a human factors perspective, but also his work really is applied into some of the more human computer interaction side of things because he's one of the people that really went for like a distributed version of situation awareness. So you're offloading things into your environment. Um, a good way to think about that is Google. So we don't have to remember everything all the time. We know where to go find it. We go look in Google and it, we can off, we can find an answer to our questions. So he was a, has had a big an impact on me and that's kind of where I found myself into like situation awareness, applied to aviation, but also too for telecommunications, um, which I think really plays well into some of the, some of the VR research that goes on now. Like how do you make uh, make somebody make it feel like an experience is real when you're distributed away from them and you're not in their physical space. So Frank Durso is a, probably my biggest recommendation or who I think is really big in the space. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about HCI specifically, I, I would just kind of echo the voices that so many others say. I will say personally, I have found to um, there are a ton of classes on lynda.com not sure if you're familiar with that platform Blake but it's it's a good online resource for some of these online classes and some of the teachers on those are really good uh, in particular I'd like to call out Chris Nodder he's pretty great at sort of explaining concepts and he is continuously pushing the boundaries I mentioned him several times on the show and uh, but yeah he's he's continuously pushing the boundaries and kind of um, explaining them in a way that makes sense and uh, is effective at doing so. I, you mentioned that you wanted to get my thoughts on uh, VR. Yeah, like VR I thought this people. would be a good place to okay. kind of talk about that because that, that seems like a big evolution in this kind of space. Sure. So for me, it's, it's going to be a little bit skewed for me because most people don't know this about me, and so I'm going to open up to the podcast listeners right now. And Everybody you, Blake, hold on. Hold on. For your horses. Uh, hold on to your horses. Um, I actually didn't want to go to school for human factors. Oh. I'll, I'll let that sink in. I'll let that sink in for a sec. I didn't actually want to go to school for human factors. I actually applied to 10 programs. Eight of them were social psychology. And so I wanted to find this nice mix between social psychology and virtual reality. And so my leaders in this sort of area are Jeremy Balenson and um, Jim Blaskovich. So these guys are doing sort of these social studies in virtual environments, and I keep a close eye on them. And uh, if you're interested in any of the stuff that I talk about, go check those guys out because they got a whole book called Infinite Reality um, where you can check out some of their past studies and kind of see – the trains of thought that got me interested into human factors. Um, 
it got me to apply to several different human factors programs. I said two, but you know, they, they were the ones that got me out of that comfort zone and, and kind of said, well, if I can do this and this, then what else is possible with this whole human factors thing? So go check them out. Uh, that's all I'll say for that one. So for a small second to Nick's little admission, I uh, definitely didn't know anything about human factors and did not want to be a human factors pr- practitioner by any means. That kind of all fell in my hands. I wanted to play metal music and record tunes. and That's what I wanted to do when I got out of college. But it was because of a psychology professor that recommended me look into a human factors program. And I'm actually going to plug one of my graduate professor's books. Uh, her name is Kim Vu. That's Kim V-U. Uh, she is an excellent teacher thought in human in the human factors world and she actually wrote a co-wrote a book with uh, robert proctor called human factors and web design so if you're really looking to like keep up with current trends and how uh human factors research and psychology behavior interacts with technology she is a great person to follow so again that's dr kim vu she's the reason i got into human factors and that's all i got all right, so let's go ahead and get into another one of these. What do you want to do? Two, three, or four? Uh, you know, man, I always pick them. What do you? What <laughs> scratches your fancy? Okay, um, I like. I, I haven't read these, but let's go with two because I feel like this could spawn some good discussion here. Yes, I like this one too. Okay, go cool. On. Okay, good. All right, so this one is titled "Walkthrough or Tutorial." And this is by Imagine Focus on the user experience subreddit. So Imagine Focus goes on to write, Hello, I'm finishing up uh, developing a dating app that allows users to swipe for other individuals through the use of a filter menu, among other functionalities. What is the best technique for creating a wa- walkthrough or tutorial on how to use the app? Should I have a couple of static pages before the user enters the app? Should I have a small pop-ups that uh, that helps users navigate through the app? Has anyone had a su- higher success rate with UX with one versus the other? Uh, this is an interesting one, I would say. So, I'm, I'm. Do you have strong feelings about this one, Nick? I don't, and I think it comes down to sort of, you know, what. what what do you think is going to work for your users, right? That's that's ultimately what it comes down to. It yeah, so so I do have strong feelings about this. This is why I picked it. Um, because Okay, so this is, again, I'm an N of one, but I have read a lot about this kind of, what, what do I choose? Do I do a full-on walkthrough for, or a tutorial, or how do I get people to learn how to use my app? And this is, Nick is definitely right. It's going to depend on your user base, depend on what it is, but... A lot of times when I download something for the first time, I've got it in my head what I know what I want to do. So the the most recent thing I've downloaded from my phone was like a video editor specifically to help me cut down video for Instagram, right? So when when I upload the app, the first thing that will drive me to not use your application and undownload it through my phone is if you will not let me drill down and get exactly to where I want to go. These apps that have all these static screens that kind of create this giant barrier to entry that's going to show you every possible feature that is layered with inside this app drive me insane. And I know I'm not alone in that. So I think if you're going, if you're going to provide a tutorial or a walkthrough and there's definitely times where it's going to be necessary to do so, um, cause you can't always create something that just, that is just that intuitive by nature, but I really encourage people and I try and do it in all my own designs or with people that I work with is if I'm going to include tutorial content, it's going to be context specific. So it's not going to be all up front when somebody logs in, it's going to be as they're walking through the process of actually trying to use your app, um, and really focusing on what is go, what's this experience that we're talking about here? Is this the, the baseline? This is all the things you should be able to do as you walk through it. Are you showing people advanced features over time? That kind of stuff. So if, I, if if you're looking for my intuition, right, I would stay away th- from doing these static screens and sticking more to like contextual help. Yeah. So I think it all comes down to how you design this app, right? I think that swiping is a pretty well known convention at this point. Um, I think also though you can employ a couple of those UX design tricks where you sort of. Uh, have these affordances like shadows implying that these things can be moved um, and also sort of maybe 
colors on the border that imply that left is bad and right is good, you know, like red and green or something. You know, there there are affordances that you can make and they can be passive that can disappear over time as the user becomes more accustomed to the interface. And I I agree with you, Blake. Sometimes tutorials can be awful. Like think about a video game or something. But uh Yeah, I sorry, you raise your hand. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh no! I didn't mean to raise my hand, but oh. <laughs> the, I just made me laugh because the the one my favorite game franchise ever is Gears of War, but they are the worst for their tutorials. They're really bad, man. Like, and and it's like I just want to get to the action. I don't want to do this. And games have been sort of hiding them within the gameplay, uh, like. You know, like, oh, you need to learn to use a sword. So, you you know, like, hit these buttons. And I like it when it's more of a passive overlay to me, where it's like, hit this button. Um, I don't like it when it's explicitly stating, like, swing the sword. Okay. And then it stops and is like, okay, now we're going to try the next technique, right? Where it just, like, shows you passively. And I, okay, as much as I shit on the Nintendo Switch, I got I to gotta hand it to them. They have a pretty good, like, passive thing for what you should do to um sync controllers or to to do certain commands in a game where um and mario's the exception they kind of bring up a video and are like here's the thing and they show it for a brief second and then it's gone so i guess that's okay if you want to watch it you can but they kind of just interject them and then they're gone and you know they're they're at a place where you can find them later um, but I don't know, we're talking about this dating app and I, I just think it kind of comes down to how you design it. It should be intuitive, but if you're going to pick a walkthrough or a tutorial, I'm a big fan of walkthroughs where, uh, with skippable options, right? If you know what you're doing, you should be able to skip it. If you don't know what you're doing, uh, have the, have the user walk through it so that they're actually completing the actions to where they understand the, the actions that they are making. Couldn't agree more, Mr. Nicholas. Okay, well, uh, I guess we have time for one more if you want to get into it. Oh, yeah, why not? It's always kind of fun to do that. Uh, Okay, so we kind of, uh, this one's going to frustrate me. Let's go for number four. <laughs> this one's going to piss oh, me man. off. That sounds right, sure. piss yeah, number me four off so is. bad. Okay, yeah, nothing nothing like ending the podcast on a pissed off note. All right, so here we go. <laughs> this one's how to work user testing into an organization that doesn't support it on the user experience subreddit by uh, Mephisto11234. So Mephisto goes on to write, long story short, my company and I who are ro- working on a multi-million dollar products do not really support user testing. When I ask how can we implement testing, stakeholders tell me I can wrangle up some tech dude, some tech support dudes and have them go through flows. I argue this won't give us the best results, but so far it has fallen on deaf ears. My only manager who is a dev and not UX doesn't see the need for testing either. UXers, what would you do if you had the same ability to do testing on your own but can't spend much money, if anything, on testing? Uh, How do you support it without the org's support? I am the sole UX UI designer. Okay, Blake, I want to get your thoughts on this because I got some strong opinions. Yeah, I do too, and this is a touchy one. Um, the, the real answer here is I, I'm really focusing on this last question. How do you do it without the org support? You you don't. Because if this is re- like a lot of people say they work on multi-million dollar products. And so I don't really know what that means in this case. But if that is definitely the truth, you don't want to go outside of their legal realms of responsibility. Uh, that's where you can really get yourself into trouble. And it will, you will no longer be a solo UX designer. You will be a jobless one. So <laughs> really pay attention to that kind of stuff. Um, okay. So... I wish I had, this is the times I wish we were talking to these people because we had more information. I could get better intuitions or advice, I guess. But if you, if all you can do is wrangle up some support tech dudes, <laughs> which is awesome. I, I guess hope that's really verbatim what they said to you. Um, but if that's nothing. all you could do and they don't actually work on the product that you're specifically building, in some ways I find that's better than nothing. Likely they have some understanding of maybe the product lines that you're developing. I'm assuming again that if you're developing multi-million dollar products, you're you can get maybe tech dudes from a different department that don't touch this specific product. Uh, so that's maybe not the worst thing. Uh, the only other real advice I can give you is if you 
and again, this I'm really stressing, you don't do this without your org support. You have to go and talk to somebody who will give you the opportunity to say, hey, okay, so we can't spend any money on testing. What if I did my own testing on my own time during my lunch hour? I run one person. That's it. Like it's, it's on my own time. It gives you an insight and potentially data on our product. That's how I would go about it because really the hard part is here, especially if you're a big company that's obviously successful from the way you're describing it. It is that much harder to make them understand that, hey, you need to really be testing these products so you can make them better. But it sounds part of the problem could be that you're not selling it enough. Um, so really going going deep and understanding like, hey, what do these these stakeholders, whether it's your CEO or your product manager, actually care about? What are the words that I need to say that they want to hear? What's what's the bottom line? How's the bottom line going to be improved by me doing user testing? Um, so there, there's some kind of guerrilla ways to go about it, but I really, I know I've said it like four times, but I can't stress enough, you need to do it with somebody's permission because um, you don't want to put yourself in a bad position like coming up with them oh hey i did user testing you did what you don't need that um but nick what do you got yeah i agree so uh let's see how do i handle this diplomatically so i know people who work at companies that don't do user testing that i think was vague enough for me to not get in trouble uh, <laughs> and let's say that companies that I know people work at that don't do user testing should do user testing. Um, reason they don't is because they work at companies where it's very competitive and ideas that get leaked are stolen by other competitors. Do you have any idea what I'm talking about here, Blake? I certainly do. Okay. But am I being okay, vague that, enough? That's am, a funny conversation. Am I being vague enough? Oh, yeah, you're totally vague enough. I just okay. I know you. Okay. Uh so so with that being said, they can't enlist the everyday Joe to participate in their studies or to participate in um I can't call it by its actual name, but UX testing, right? I can't they they can't do that because sure. yeah. because then a bunch of NDAs will have to be signed and you, you risk ideas being leaked out to the public. And so there is that aspect of it where you want to closely contain it. That being said, friends and family should be able to do this thing uh, because it, it's sort of unspoken that you can trust them as long as they are a certain demographic. I feel like the more I talk about it, the more it's becoming clear what I'm talking about. But that being said, um, yeah, tech dudes are better than nothing. <laughs> well, I, I, honestly, Nick, I think it, I don't think anybody particularly can pinpoint what you're talking about. But I'm going to give a different example of something that that we can talk about because it's out there in the ether. People know about it. And we've we've actually talked about it on the show before is uh, in this in that case where it's so secretive. And so like if it, if it gets out, somebody's going to steal it. Uh, companies like IBM actually pay specific people. They're going to be their user testers. And that's what that's who they bring in yeah. constantly. Now, you run into some weird stuff, of course, like there's there's bias and it's the same person continually testing the product, but it's making the effort to figure out, OK, I don't want this being leaked out. What can I do? Who can I can I pay somebody to continually come and test this product so we can kind of do the same kind of improvements based on user tests. Um, so I totally see where you're coming from. And I think there there are definitely ways around it. Um, but yeah, this is a tough situation to be in for sure. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I I in this specific industry that I'm referencing that will remain vague. Uh, they don't do that. <laughs> they I mean, they hire people to test other aspects of the thing, but they don't hire people to do user sort of usability stuff. It's yeah, it's a really you. interesting thing. But uh, you know what, man? Let's let's get out of here because it's it's late on a Monday night. I'm ready for bed. Uh, that's it for today, everyone. I was gonna have Alexa read this, but you know what? Her voice is a little a little quiet today, so so I'll just do it. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you guys have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you guys want us to cover, you can follow us all over social media, or you can leave us a message on our Slack. Link to that is in our show notes. You can head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. We're at H Factors Podcast. 
Be sure to check out our SoundCloud and leave us a comment over there, or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC for Human Factors Cast. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. And special shout out to Mateo for supporting on us. Uh, supporting on us. I almost made it through the outro without messing it up. Mateo, thank you for being a Patreon supporter. We appreciate it. If you don't want to support us on Patreon, you don't have any money, like Mateo, we understand. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Every little bit helps. We uh, succeed with your word of mouth, and we can only reach other people through you guys. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstorff for hanging out over there with me today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about VR canes? If you want to talk about VR canes, the best place to reach me is in the Human Factors Cast Slack. But if you're also on social media, you can always check me out at Don't Panic UX on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. And until next time, hit the prince! Prince!